Hey everybody, what's up and welcome back. If you're new here, I'm Liz. And today we're gonna to be talking about a 27 Club member. So today we're gonna to be talking about Dickie Pride. Now, if you're new here, oh, that was really delayed. If you're new here, I'm Liz. I talk about some true crime on my channel. Um, I would love if you wanted to stick around, be a part of my little YouTube family I got going on here. Um, don't forget to subscribe, turn your post notifications on to all. That way you know whenever I upload. And don't forget to like any of my videos. That way I know what you like and what you want to continue to see. Now, let's get into today's 27 Club case. So on March 26th of 1969, Dickie Pride would be found by his sister Anne after he had accidentally suffered from an overdose on sleeping pills. Now, if you don't know who Dickie Pride is, well, let me tell you. Dickie Pride grew up loving music. He would go on to joining as an opera singer in the Royal School of Church Music in Croydon, England. He would then also form a skiffle group called the Semitones. This would be his first real taste of making music with others. Now, it would be in late 1958 that Russ Conway would hear him sing while he was performing at the Castle Public House. After he sees him at the Castle Public House, Conway then informs Larry Parnes, who is a very successful, very successful music manager in England, of whom would sign Dickie. And at the time when they met, Dickie was not going by Dickie Pride. This was actually his stage name. He was still going by his birth name, which was Richard Charles Neller. So after signing him, Dickie was born. He was a brand new person. This was his persona. In March of the following year, he would release his debut song. His debut song was Slippin' and Sliding, which was a cover of Little Richard's song. The only other single that he released that even would make it in the top 40 in the UK was a song called Primrose Lane and this only appeared in October of 1959 for one week at the number 28 spot. So it was no doubt that he was a good singer. He was actually really known for his singing because I guess his voice was able to travel so far and his voice caused vibrations that would literally shake the arena. That's how powerful of a voice he had. But even with the most powerful voices, he was not the most successful with his music career. So like I said, even though he was a great singer, he just, there was no substance. There, there wasn't anything there. There was no, like, as, as me and my sister say, there was no je ne sais quoi. There was nothing about him that kept people coming back. And when it came to his records, they weren't selling, unfortunately. So uh, around this time, Dickie would have to take a job as a driver to help pay his bills during some of the time when he was recording and performing. And it's also known during this time, it was a crucial point of when he started doing drugs, his mental health would fade. But he, I mean, also one positive is that he did get married. Uh, eventually he and his wife would divorce and this was shortly after their son was born. He would grow worse during this point. Um, he tried to start, he did try to start two other like groups. Unfortunately for these groups, they were flops. One was the governors and the other one was the sidewinders. Uh, they also, just like I mentioned, they flopped, but they also failed to produce any major success for Dickie. Uh, following his divorce from his wife, he would move back home to live with his mom and his sister, Anne. And it's during this time that his heroin addiction would grow, like, would vastly grow. It would get continuously worse. He also would be admitted to a psychiatric clinic in which he did receive a lobotomy. No, I'm not kidding. Um, he also received a treatment of which they insert radioactive particles into his frontal lobe. And this was thought to help cure him. It is said, even though these are very strange things to do to somebody's head, it is said that he did have control of himself for about a year and he was able to kick, kick his habits for about a year, but he eventually fell back on them. So it was kind of just like a band-aid, if you will. So let's kind of backtrack to the day of, I mean, 
now I've kind of told you a little bit about his life. Obviously, we found him dead, or his sister found him dead on the 26th of March of 1969. Unfortunately, he would be added to the 27 Club. Um, the odd thing about his death, though, is that it was never, even though he's known in the music industry, it was never publicly announced that he died and that he became a member of the 27 Club. Obviously, the 27 Club kind of was like, it wasn't really a thing then. We had we had musicians and people that were famous dying around that time, yes, but it was never really publicly known as the 27 Club. It, years later, it was publicly known as the 27 Club, but why why didn't they publicly announce that he died? Where I mean, even, yes, he was a musician in England, but I'm sure many people probably heard his music across the pond, if you will, as they say. What are your thoughts? Leave them in the comments down below. I would love to know. And I will see you guys in the next video.